Everybody, this is Tracy here with another edition of Review from Tracy's Point, and we are here to talk about This Is Us, Season 5, Episode 7, entitled There. So This Is Us writers are just playing too much with our emotions. So you guys remember in the preview after Episode 6, which took place about three weeks ago, they've been on hiatus due to COVID-19 and the studios having to shut down. And so on the little preview that they gave us, it appeared that Kevin was in a car accident and we were like, oh my God, I hope Kevin's okay. You can't take it if something happens to Kevin. Well, it turns out that Kevin is a-okay, all right? He wasn't in a tragic accident after all. So as you guys know, with these episodes of This Is Us, that they have a lot of flashback scenes. And so in this episode, we have flashbacks of Jake when he was a teenager playing baseball. And then we have flashbacks of Kevin when he was a teenager playing football. And so I try to lump all this together instead of doing all the back and forth. So basically in the scene with Jake as a teenager, you know, he plays little league baseball and he's suffering from anxiety because his dad is always writing him on his case, judging him, you know, like telling him he's not good enough. He's not playing hard enough. And so Jake and his dad are heading to the baseball game in one scene. Then we have a scene where Jake comes out after the game and the dad is waiting by the car. He's drinking beer in the parking lot. And so it turns out the team lost the game and is actually the pitcher for the team. And so he lost it with a walk-off home run, I believe it's called a walk-on home run at any event. <laughs> okay, I think that means that there are people that were on the base, the batter came up and hit the ball and so the first person that, you know, ran in won the game, but don't quote me on, you know, gave the game winning point, I should say. So the dad blames Jack, you know, for, you know, pitching the ball and making this happen. Jack is trying to say, you know, it's a team sport. My other team members played a part because we shouldn't have been in the position where this could have taken place in the first place. So realizing that his dad is a bit tipsy, Jack suggests that they wait a bit and not go home. And so the dad is upset and offended, you know, that Jack is like insinuating that he's too drunk to drive. And so the dad throws him the keys and tell him, okay, well, you drive home since you know it all. And so Jack is terrified, of course, that he's going to get in an accident. He doesn't know what he's doing. But he gets in the driver's seat, you know, not believing that his dad is making him drive and he ends up getting them home. And then when they get home, the dad finally compliments him and tell him that he did a decent job, you know, driving when he didn't really know how to drive. And so as they are driving home, the dad um, tells him that his problem is that he spends too much time in his head. He's overthinking things and that he just needs to relax and let it happen. And so he pushes Jack to drive faster, you know, as he continues to berate him. And then finally, Jack yells, you know, for his dad to shut up and leave him alone. And so then the dad says, you know, his lips are sealed. We'll just see if you can get home safely. And of course, Jack was able to do so. So then in the scenes with Kevin, as a youngster, Kevin was trying to remember the play calls using the cards that, remember, Randall had taught him how to make notes and how to study because the coach was saying that, you know, he wasn't memorizing the plays and he had to get better before he benched them. So they were preparing for this trip where they were going to Allegheny College for a quarterback camp. And so there's supposed to be two Penn State players there. And Jack is thinking, okay, if you do good in front of these players, then they might have connections that'll get you into Penn State. You know, Penn State has a pretty big football program. At least they did back then. I'm not sure what they're doing since the big scandal a couple of years ago. 
But in any event, Jack is thinking long term, okay? Like get into Penn State, get recognized, become a NFL player, right? So after work, Jack and Kevin, you know, they're heading to the football camp. And so on the drive to the camp, Jack shares with Kevin that he used to be a pitcher and was really good at it. But his dad, you know, kind of like made it not fun for him. And so he had dreams of being the next Bob friend. And Kevin is looking at him like, who is Bob friend? And so Jack explains that he was a four time all star and that he played in the 1960s World Series. So Kevin realizes how much his dad paid for the camp that he's about to go to. And he's like, dad, we can't afford this. Like, what are you doing? But Jack lets him know that when he gets a scholarship to Penn State, it will be the best investment that he's ever made. So then the scene goes to them at the hotel and um, Kevin's coach was in the lobby with the two Penn State players, you know, so they chat a little bit. And so he makes the comment that he's hoping that everything he said to Kevin has sunk in and that he's going to, you know, apply himself and do good in the camp. <laughs> And so upstairs in the hotel room, Kevin is stressed and he's, you know, vomiting into the toilet like he is a ball of nerves. And so Jack gives him some water and, you know, Kevin says that the reason he's sick is because of the sloppy Joe. But, you know, because of his past experiences with his own dad, Jack knows that there's more to it than that. So they end up talking and Kevin finally opens up and tells him that he fears not doing well. And he reveals that he overheard um, Jack telling Rebecca that he was too soft on him and or that Kevin was too soft or something like that. So Kevin thinks that the reason Jack came on the trip is because he thinks that the only way he can be special is through football and so he's really pushing him along because if he doesn't do well in football then I guess he's just going to be a bomb and not good at anything and he also talked about you know how Kate and Randall had multiple things that they were good at, but he only had football. And Kevin tells Jack, you know, that the coach tells him that he's stupid almost every day of his life. Now, I don't know if the man is literally saying stupid or the, the way he's talking to Kevin makes Kevin feel stupid. But of course, this doesn't sit well with Jack. So Jack jumps up and says that they need to go get something to eat. Now I'm like, Jack, how y'all need to go get something to eat when the boy just said he was throwing up because of the sloppy joe that he had. So it seems like he done already ate. But anyway, they go downstairs, okay? And so Jack shares the story, you know, about, you know, the dad used to show up to his games, um, you know, drunk and would ruin the experience for him. And that his dad stressed him out so bad, you know, on the games that they would lose. And it was like, he never really, you know, congratulated him or told him he did a good job otherwise. And so he said he loved um, baseball, but it became all about his dad. And so Kevin mentions how um, Jack never talked much about his dad. And so Jack explains that he wasn't all that bad. Like he wasn't a horrible dad and that that's what creates the image of parents and that they make up you know, these million little pieces of who they are, but we focus, you know, on those things that we remember, you know, of the parent mistreating them, like treating them really bad or the times that the parents were really nice to them. And so he told Kevin, you know, that he promised he would never do anything like that to him, you know, because they're just alike. And so he knows what Kevin is going through. And I really enjoyed those two um, flashback scenes because it reminded me so much of my relationship with my youngest daughter. Well, actually, well, with my oldest daughter, like I would always put my daughter into stuff like to try and find out what her gift and talent was. And so, and I might have told you guys the story once before about the gymnastics and how the lady told me that, you know, my daughter was too tall or something. Whatever she said about my daughter, like she didn't think gymnastics would be good for her. So to try to find something else. And so, you know, I would just constantly move around, change things. Like, let's try this. Let's try that. And so my daughter's gifts is that she is a very good artist. She can draw. She can make, you know, um, pottery, all types of things. And she was really, really good at 
Um, she did cheerleading, but that didn't last too long because I didn't like the atmosphere of the Little League cheerleading because I wasn't trying to raise no hoochie mamas, okay? So the cheerleading, I think, lasted about two years. Then she, she used to um, work at the, at the team camp. Then she taught at the youth arts program. So she really focused on the arts and on teaching. And now she is a school teacher. But now that she has her own daughter, you know, she's always telling me how she thinks that the baby ain't even one yet. But my daughter swears she's going to be a gymnast. And so I, you know, I tell her, you know, well, maybe she will be. And then I think about how my daughter probably really wanted to stick with the gymnastics, but I wasn't listening to her. I was listening to the lady that was over the program and I denied her that opportunity. And then with my youngest daughter, she played tennis. She played tennis from the time she was seven years old. And up until she was in college, she played for um, her college team. And so, you know, when Jack was talking about the money that he invested, in that camp for Kevin would, you know, get a good return if Kevin got into, you know, a good university. And so when I look back over the money that I spent on my daughter and her tennis, you know, I could have saved that money and paid for my child's college education. And then I think about how my daughter, you know, she was so, like she was really, really good at tennis, but I don't think she enjoyed the experience of tennis and so she would like yell and scream and just be very uptight and you know tennis is an individual sport and if you can't get out of your own head then you're not going to succeed at tennis but you know by the grace of god she did get a college degree <laughs> so um it wasn't all that bad but i could definitely relate to these flashback scenes that they have going on here so now let's get into the modern day story um, that we were all waiting on to see if Kevin got into this car accident. So Kevin is rehearsing his lines like we done skipped all from the, we done went backwards, I guess, because remember he was talking to Randall on the phone and then he hung up with Randall that was on the little clip before we thought he got into the accident. So they backed it up you know to earlier in the day kevin is rehearsing his lines um kate calls to thank him for the edible arrangements that he sent and we found out that ellie um is having labor having her labor induced you know that she's getting ready to have the baby and toby and kate are on their way to the hospital and so it's an important night for Kevin and probably one of the biggest of his career. So he is supposed to be, they kept saying De Niro, but I'm sure they were talking about Robert De Niro. He is actually going to be in this movie that Kevin, Kevin is in. And so they're getting ready to shoot the scene and they're waiting on Robert De Niro to come five minutes before they're supposed to start. And, you know, Kevin is all hyped up. He's excited. You know, he can't wait to get back home, you know, to finish up the scene, then get back home to Madison and be there, you know, until she has the baby. So on set, he and the stage person are talking about the upcoming scene when Madison calls to let him know that she thinks that she is having contractions. So she thinks it's the real thing and not, um, I can't think of the term that they use where they're like false labor pains, but, you know, she says that the doctor told her to go to the hospital as soon as possible. So then Foster, who's the director, he comes in and Kevin tells him, you know, his fiance is in labor and Foster is pretty much dismissive of what Kevin is saying. And he starts to tell Kevin, oh, you know, everything's going to be okay. My nephew was born super, super early. And guess what? He's getting ready to graduate as valedictorian of his class. So Kevin is, you know, laying out his case as to why, you know, he needs to leave without saying he needs to leave. You know, he's talking about how Madison is alone. It's her first pregnancy, you know, and that basically he thinks he should be there. So Foster is looking at him like, what part of... This scene is about to be shot in the next five minutes and we have one of the biggest names in the industry. Are you not comprehending? So, you know, he you know takes a deep breath and then he breaks it down to Kevin to let him know that, you know, we need to get this scene taken care of. You cannot be leaving to go see about your pregnant girlfriend 
But of course, Kevin is only hearing himself. Okay, all he is hearing is, I need to go save the day. I need to go and be with Madison. So Foster says, you know, he's willing to compromise. He tells Kevin it's going to take about six to seven hours for them to shoot the scene. And then he's willing to move things around so that Kevin can go and be with Madison, be there when the twins arrive and then come back and finish filming this movie. And so not understanding and not caring about this production, the money that has been spent, the fact that they have Robert De Niro, he's probably only available that day. <laughs> like Kevin wasn't listening to none of that. So he says that, you know, it's not going to work, Foster. I'm sorry. He says he's leaving. Um, he's going to be with Madison and he wants to be there. You know, he's apologized. And then he walks off. And I'm sitting there like, Kevin has lost his ever-loving mind, <laughs> like somebody finally gives you the opportunity that you have been looking for and this is how you are going to act. And I understand the whole thing about wanting to be there, you know, but these are things that he should have considered before he accepted the job. And when they told him that they had to go to Vancouver, you know, because of COVID, Kevin should have thought about all of this and made a decision then. So he, I felt that he was being very, very selfish in that moment. And so, you know, Kevin leaves and he's checking on Madison. You know, she's breathing hard and sure that she's going into labor, you know, that it's not, you know, false contractions. And so then when Kevin tells her that he's leaving and on his way home, she was surprised, but it wasn't a surprised oh my god you can't do that it was more of a surprise somebody finally put me first in their life and so we'll learn more about that later on in the show so i looked it up to see you know how long it was going to get going to take kevin to get to la because i'm assuming they're in la so vancouver to la by driving is 20 hours okay and then it's three hours by plane so let's see how kevin is going to work this out so kevin seems to have been on the road for quite a while because when he walked off the set the sun was shining brightly okay but then when we get this next scene of him he is driving on the he's driving and it's dark outside it's obviously nighttime so he's on the phone talking to Miguel and Miguel, you know, is trying to help him find the flight. And he says that the only flights um, that are available, and I guess they were looking for like first class, are, you know, leaving out the following morning. He can't get him a flight that night. So then Kevin says that he has to leave that night. You know, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So Miguel is trying to work with him, asking if he minds flying economy, you know, because Kevin is tall and he always complains about being uncomfortable, but Kevin is distracted. Okay. So he's like all over the place, cars zooming all around him. He's about to have an accident. And this is why we thought he had an accident. So Rebecca, you know, is basically getting on his nerves because she says she had found the flight. Then she realized she put Victoria in the search engine instead of Vancouver. And so, you know, Kevin's like, oh my God, you know, like, come on, help me out here. So then they find some domestic flights out of Seattle and tell Kevin, you know, keep driving towards the border. They're going to try and see if there's a flight that's leaving, you know, when's the next flight because evidently it's late. And, you know, the later it gets, the less flights that are going out. So then Kevin's agent is calling and he's not giving up. Kevin ignoring the call, but the man kept calling back. So he finally answers the call and the agent wants to make sure that Foster got the story wrong. Okay, that Kevin did not walk off on Robert De Niro. Like what is wrong with him? So his, the agent name is Brian. So Brian tells him that he may be able to salvage things for Kevin if he can get back to Vancouver the following day after Madison gives birth. And so then Madison calls and then Kevin hangs up on Brian. Like he doesn't want to hear anything that Brian has to say. 
So Madison is at the hospital waiting on a room and Kevin is showing his privilege and going off about them not having a private room available for Madison. So she's trying to explain to him that they would have had a room available for her if it was her due date, like if she was not in labor two months early. You know, but they need to make accommodations or find accommodations, you know, because they already have other patients there. So Kevin needs to chill out, but Kevin isn't hearing it. You know, he thinks that the doctor needs to do something. The hospital needs to do something because Madison needs her own room. And I'm like, he is such an asshole. <laughs> I hate to say it. I was trying to empathize with Kevin, but he was making it very hard to do. So he's not paying attention, you know, going into incoming traffic. And so we're like, oh my God, like what is going on? So he lets Madison know that he's on his way and promises to be there before the babies arrive. So then Randall calls. So everybody's calling Kevin. Randall calls. And so this was, you know, the end of episode six. And so, of course, it's all about Kevin and what he wants and what he needs. And, you know, Randall is trying to talk to him about his experience in New Orleans, which seemed like it was a decade ago. But Kevin, you know, he can't, it's not registering in his brain that is trying to tell him something about himself. He can only, you know, focus on, you know, he's got to get to Madison to save the day. And so he ends the call with Randall and basically looks down and Foster is calling. So he answers the phone. So Foster asks Kevin, you know, to please turn around and come back. And so he realizes that Kevin is being emotional. He's not, you know, thinking clearly, but they can work this out that he's come up with a solution to the problem. But Kevin cuts him off and goes into real drama queen mode. And he tells Foster to shut up, that no one cares about his stupid movie, and that basically he quits. He's not coming back. And so Foster, the look on Foster's face was like, who the hell do he think he's talking to? And so Kevin hangs up on him. Like, I'm like, oh my God, Kevin. Listen, he is going to be blackballed in the industry. So he needs to find something else that he is good at because I just don't see them salvaging this, you know, situation. But Kevin is not that great of an actor, right? Because if he was, he would have had a job by now. But anyway, <laughs> moving on. So Madison, you know, finally has a room and she's seen the doctor. And so the babies are well enough to be born. They're developed enough that the doctor doesn't see any complications and that she is definitely in labor. So Madison has to go, you know, so that they can change the baby's position. They want to move her around or something. And so Kevin is upset, you know, that she, I felt that Kevin was upset that she wasn't acknowledging all the sacrifices that he had made. You know, the fact that he walked off the set, he then cussed out the, the director of the movie, he disrespecting his agent. And so, you know, not that he had even told her any of these things, but he just expected her, you know, to understand that he was giving up a lot. He was sacrificing a lot to get there, to be with her, you know, when the babies were born. So then they lose the signal on the phone. Okay, so like, Lord have mercy. So he loses the signal, you know, he can't get through, can't make any calls. So then he notices that a car has left the road. And I couldn't figure out because when he was on the different phone calls, like cars were zooming around him, like he was driving too slow. And it was like a two lane highway, like one lane, you know, in both directions. And so I'm not sure if this guy was one of the people that had zoomed around um, Kevin earlier in the episode. So Kevin notices the car, you know, so he stops and realizes that the car is on fire. And so he's still unable to get a signal to call 911. So he decides that he's going to go down in the ravine to rescue the person in the car, because of course that's what Jake would do, right? So he drops his wallet in the process and doesn't realize that he dropped his wallet. So now I swear in the preview from the last episode where the, that there was a woman calling Kevin's name saying, Mr. Pearson, Mr. Pearson, but we didn't get any of that in this 
episode. So maybe I was imagining that and it didn't really happen. So we moving on, okay? So for some odd reason, Kevin is driving the man to the hospital. So the car is on fire, the man is stuck. Kevin somehow gets him, he lifts up the steering wheel because the guy was like trapped in his legs or something with the airbag. So Kevin lifts the steering wheel, pulls the man out of the car, then the car, the fire is moving up. So Kevin gets the guy, drags him back up the ravine to safety. And then in the next scene, they are on their way to the hospital. And I'm trying to figure out why Kevin ain't called 911. <laughs> like, okay, you didn't have reception. You were in a dead spot. But I'm sure 20 yards up the road, you got the reception back. And I'm like, why did he not call 911 on route to the hospital to tell these people that there was this car accident, blah, blah, blah. So I guess it was so that they could have a conversation about Jack always being present in every moment because, you know, Jack got to come back up. So he did find time, though, even though he couldn't call 911 <laughs> to tell him about this accident, he did find time to call Madison and leave her a message about how he's trying to get to her, you know, but Madison wasn't answering the phone. It might have been during the time they were trying to flip her over. Maybe she had not fell asleep or maybe she didn't have no reception either. So the guy realizes that it is Kevin Pearson who has saved him. Now, what I think might happen is that it will get out that Kevin saved this guy's life. It's going to cause like a social media firestorm and they are going to kind of like um, force Foster to keep in that movie. Now, this, you know, this is the writer in me that's saying this stuff because I'm trying to save this season of This Is Us, okay? So they get this social media frenzy, right? And the people are like, oh, no, you can't fire him. He was trying to get to his babies, you know, be there when the babies are born. Then he stopped and he's a superhero and he helped this man. He's got to be in this movie. And then Foster realizes that all the publicity is going to drum up support for the movie. And the movie will turn out to be a blockbuster and Kevin will get his Oscar. <laughs> okay. That's my story and I'm sticking to it, guys. Okay. So anyway, all this craziness that was going on that wasn't making any sense. So the guy realizes it's Kevin Pearson. So, you know, the guy's falling in and out of consciousness. Kevin is trying to keep him alert. You know, he tells him about Madison, you know, how she's in labor. He's probably not going to get there in time. The kids will remember that he wasn't there for the most important day of their life, blah, 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 blah. Because, you know, he has to be the superhero that Jack was. So the man tells Kevin, like he has, he just said he had triplets or he had three teenagers. I think he said three teenagers. And he says, I assure you that this is not the most important day of your kid's life. And as a matter of fact, until they're in kindergarten, they're not even going to remember nothing that happened before that. So you're like putting all this pressure on yourself for no reason. So then Kevin, you know, starts lamenting about Jack and how he was the most their person that ever lived, and he says that Jack would have rescued the man, figured out how to be there on time for the births, you know, cut the umbilical cord and everything else. So Kevin gets to the hospital, beeps his horn, <laughs> I think he got out the car, the paramedics, not the paramedics, but the hospital personnel came out with the uh, wheelchair, put the man in the wheelchair, and then Kevin rolled off into the sunset. Now, in what world is this happening in? The only world I know that that happens in is when the little gangbangers and the drug dealers get to shooting each other, and one of them gets shot, they pull him in the car, go to the hospital, dump him off in the emergency room, and then drive off because they don't want to be, you know, in trouble with the police or connected to the shooting or have to answer questions. Now, that happens a lot. But for the average Joe Blow citizen to just drive up to the hospital, dump this man who could have internal injuries or something else going on, because remember, he just was in a car accident, so he could have internal bleeding, all this stuff. Kevin just dumped the man off, didn't tell the people, you know, give him any details, didn't tell him where the car was, that the car was on fire or anything else, Okay. So Kevin makes it to the airport on time and lo and behold, 
Oh, I think, did I tell you guys the part where they found the plane ticket and Kevin had like two hours to get there? I think I did tell you that. So he gets there on, on time and then lo and behold, he's at the TSA checkpoint and he doesn't have his ID because remember, he dropped his wallet at the scene of the accident. So he begs and pleads with the TSA agent, tells her about his heroic efforts, and even plays on her sensibilities about the pregnant girlfriend in labor wanting to be there. The lady was like, oh, wow, well, I'm so sorry that this is happening to you, but you can't get on this plane unless you have some ID. Then he tells her he is Kevin Pearson. Like, you can Google me, okay? The lady was like, no, sir, you need your ID. You can go over there to that office and request a temporary ID, but you won't get that to in the morning. And unfortunately, you know, this decision is above her. She can't let him get on that airplane without his ID. So... Since Kevin, you know, had to drive from Vancouver to Seattle to catch his flight, uh, many claim, many people are saying in the comments and on Twitter and everything that he would have needed a passport in order to get across the border from Canada to the United States. And then they were going back and forth because, you know, they have that real ID thing out now. And so people were saying, well, maybe he used the real ID, but then that wouldn't have worked because he left the ID in the wallet right on the ground. And so then people were saying, well, maybe the passport, you know, maybe he had the passport because you wouldn't have put the passport in your in your wallet. It would have been separate, right? And so then they were saying, but he could have used the passport to get on the flight because your passport is considered an ID. And I know that to be true because my driver's license had expired when I went to see my daughter in Sacramento a couple of months ago. And they let me get on the plane. It was no big deal. But then on my way back from Sacramento, they said, oh, ma'am, your license is expired. And I was like, yeah, I know. But due to COVID, you know, they were extending where people, you know, could still get on the plane with an expired driver's license. And the guy was like, well, do you have another form of ID? And thank God I had my passport with me and I was able to get on the plane and get my butt back to Florida. So that was some sloppy writing going on in this episode. Oh, and then people were saying that maybe the passport was in the, in the jacket that he was wearing because he took off his jacket and put it on the guy who he rescued. And so maybe that's how they're going to make the connection that it was Kevin Pearson that found him or the guy was going to tell him or somehow they were going to find the passport in the jacket and get it to Kevin as quickly as possible so that he could get on this flight, child. I don't know. But, um, yeah, there was some loose ends that wasn't tied up. And maybe during the hiatus, they decided to change up some things and, you know, change the direction of this episode. I'm not sure. So then after the whole scene at the airport, it goes to Madison. And so she's at the hospital and the nurse comes in, you know, to tell her that she's dilated to three centimeters and then sensing that something is wrong. The nurse asks um, Madison, you know, what's going on? Why you look so sad? And so Madison shares that she's afraid that she's going to have to deliver the baby all by herself. And so the nurse was like, you don't have anybody that you can call, no close family or anything. And so Madison reveals that there are only two people in her life that she's close to. And that is Kate, who is at the hospital with Ellie having her baby. And I thought Kevin and Kate lived in the same city. So maybe Ellie was in the same, would Ellie have not been in the same hospital as um, Madison? Or do they live in two pa different parts of California? I'm confused. Anyway, and then, no, they have to live in the same place because remember when they drove to San Francisco and it was only like four hours and I think Los Angeles and San Francisco are like four hours apart. So anyway, then she says Kevin, then we know that Kevin is out, you know, saving the world right now. 
So the lady tells her, you know, well, I got to go check on some other patients. She said, but I'll try and get back as quickly as possible. And so Madison basically doesn't have a relationship with her mom or any of her other family members for whatever reason. They've had some trauma and I'm sure it was discussed on the previous episode, but I don't remember right now. So she starts to cry, you know, she's trying to fight back the tears when Randall calls. And so he lets her know that Kevin, you know, told them that, you know, she was at the hospital and he says that him and Beth are there to help in any way that they can. And so he's basically sensing that Madison is upset and he tells her, even if you just need us to stay on the phone, we'll stay on the phone with you. And so at first she says, no, that's not necessary. You know, but Randall's like, are you sure? And then all of a sudden the dam broke and she started crying and she agreed. And so, you know, they're just holding on, you know, to the phone and not knowing what to do because they were driving from New Orleans back to Pennsylvania and they're all the way out on the West Coast. So it was a really sad, a really touching scene, you know, the fact that Randall, you know, was willing to be there and to hold on and to help Madison when he doesn't really know Madison that well. So I like that part. You know, anything with Beth and Randall, I love. So the only reasonable explanation <laughs> that I have for all the randomness that took place on this episode is that all of this was actually a dream sequence and that Kevin really is in a bad accident. So think about it. The car was on fire, you know, as I mentioned previously, but the car never did blow up. So how did the fire go out on the car? Did it just go out on its own? Um, how was Kevin allowed to drop the man off? You know, and no one asked questions. No one asked for information. And it just didn't make sense. Like, it was just so much about this episode that didn't make sense. And then I was thinking... Maybe I did hear the lady saying to Kevin, um, Miss, maybe I did hear a female voice saying, Mr. Pearson, Mr. Pearson. So maybe Kevin gets so desperate that he tries to run past the TSA officer and that that voice that we hear was actually her calling out Mr. Pearson, Mr. Pearson, or maybe something's going on at the airport and they need to you know, talk to Kevin and they're looking for him. I don't know, child. Y'all know my imagination get to running wild with this show because some of this stuff just is so crazy. And this had to be the craziest episode thus far. So that's it for me. Go ahead, leave your comments below, rate the video, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And until the next time, I shall talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.